Good to see you all. Welcome back to those of you that have been here before. I see a few new faces. Welcome. Thank you for joining. I say this before every talk. If I go too fast or if there's something I need to repeat, please let me know. When I get excited, I speak fast. And sometimes uh, I lose my audience because I forget that I'm not speaking to first language English speakers. So I, I completely understand if you just go, However, I'm going to try be a little bit more condensed today because we've got incredible presentation afterwards and I want to leave enough space for Olya to present. So um, I'm going to start right away with what I usually do, just introduce. This is number four of uh, seven lecture series. And um, for those of you that have been here before, this is a bit of a repetition, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, I, practice as an artist. I'm based in Vienna at the moment, but I come from Johannesburg, South Africa, and I bounce between Johannesburg and Vienna, trying to make sense of the world from two perspectives. And this lecture series is specifically about the artistic process in understanding the world that we're currently in, acknowledging our vulnerability as artists in the making, and what that means in engagement and participation with our audience and producing projects in response to sight, to condition, um, and as a provocation. And so today's uh, talk is specifically about that. And I've ad adjusted today's talk a little bit based on the feedback I got in the last lectures. There were some questions that have come up from different people in the audience that have said, I'm interested in this, or I'm interested in that, or how do I do this? So I've tried to bring in examples that illustrate some of these questions that you've posed to me last time, for example. How do you take things head on and break out of a mold that's, that you're in, etc. So I will um, take you through that journey. But before I get into the topic and into the examples, what I do in every session is I do a little warm-up exercise. Um, the first, the first warm-up exercise we did was creating a collective map through sound. I made everyone close their eyes and made this make the sounds of Usti. The second lecture, we then drew those sounds on a piece of paper and we, we combined the two. It looked something like this and sounded something like this. I'm not going to play it all because I'm going to repeat this. For the third lecture, I asked everyone in the audience to please take a piece of paper and rip the paper into pieces and create a territory map. So this was the result of last week's lecture where we had everyone making little maps of territories of what the borderlines, the areas that define our spaces are, what the concerns, concerns are around the unknown because we explored the unknown last week and what the outcome of that process is. So this map of the unknown and the kind of notes that everyone took within it was created during my talk. And then we put it together on the table here and we created a little mini installation that then changed as people played with it and uh, basically then became a little hill of anxieties and questions and unknowns and surprises and deaths and time and all kinds of keywords. So I've been through these and I read through them and I composited them and I put them together for you into the other three layers, uh, or the, the other layers from the lectures before. So as you can see, this is an evolving dialogue between you, me, and your thoughts that are coming through on paper and in sound. So, because today's session is about thinking about site-specific and condition-specific responses and provocations,
guess for me it was that moment of tasting the complexity of the debate and trying to articulate it through images. And with that is probably the most important part, is how do we visualize that which we're doing? We had a discussion the other day about is it important to uh, document something in a studio session that we have? Is it important that we document ourselves doing what we're doing to make it valid? Is it important that we as artists are, in, are not only embodied in the experience, but actually are then presented in a showcase to say, here we are? And my argument is, if we want to taste it for ourselves, no. If we want to start moving the pickle onto someone else, it's not good enough to show pictures. I should be getting a whole lot of balls of water and asking all of you to push the ball up the hill because it's that act that becomes so important. And so this idea of collaboration and participation is very, very important in the act of allowing others to participate in tasting the crisis. I'll show you another example that relates to water. This project called Temporary Museum of Art is in collaboration with Stephen Hobbs, an artist who I work with a uh, and in other places. But uh, so we um, have a, an, a township called Alexandra Township, which is all these shanty towns that you can see on, on the Yixke River. And every year the river floods, and every year the shacks get washed away, and every year people die in that process, and babies get washed down the river. And every year the city says, don't build shacks on the river edge. And every year people build their shacks again. And the next year the rain comes and everything gets washed away again. It's a horrible, horrible cycle of human nature of not learning from one's own mistakes. So going into that neighborhood, I asked the question, well, we asked the question, um, what would you like to do on that riverbank? And the artists said they would love to build a temporary museum of art in order to make people aware of the complexity of the space. And so that's what we did. In collaboration with artists in the area, we decided to build a structure that sits in the, in, in, in the riverbed. Naturally, I would let you watch the film and then talk afterwards, but I think because we want to cut it a little bit shorter today for the sake of the next speaker, I'm going to uh, speak over the film a little bit. So... You know, you say, this is so lovely. So Prophet here, um, who's a, one of the collaborators, speaks of the river and the river as this connector and, and this, this thing that used to be so lovely, but now is a transport of junk and other things, and, and talks about the, the need of the transformation of the space. And as we're working with architects and, and designers in the area and we're talking about how to transform the space, this went over several months, we start to build this idea that, that the space can be occupied and we can do something. And we de then decide to collectively um, build a temporary museum of art for the artists that have a statement to make about the environmental impact, about the question of the communication and community with their local government, about the flooding of the floodplains. And so suddenly this temporary museum of art gets a life, very temporary, but it becomes a space and an act of pure artistic provocation. Again, not for anybody else, but for themselves and for those that are watching at the moment. Colors of the cloth, gray, white, and black. These are the colors of ritual. Whatever race you may be marks the beginning of a dialogue or either a discourse between the things you can see and the things you cannot see. to look at me and surround through 
they spill food water. You're just trying to say to them, we learn this shit together. It's kind of nice. At least that's the best thing that the artist can do. I think, I think it's a statement. It's powerful. Just to say, we are in this shit together. So, Mr. White Collar, Mr. President, can you hear this, please? Don't shit in the water, because you might want to drink from it tomorrow. We learn guitar to listen to the school of the Sahara, the Harbor. Come on, let's see. And it's an issue of the pool. So let's see, come on, let's see. One year, the deep. And the camera, so that's what we read. So two very important things that happen towards the end is this acknowledgement that as the artists in this process and in this project, it was about just acknowledging that we all face the same complexity, whether we're living on the banks of the river or somewhere else. It is this, um, this we're in the shit together kind of attitude that we need to start letting people understand in that area. And maybe collectively we can make a change so that people don't build their shacks next to the river so that they don't get washed away every year and that we don't have deaths. And so this was very much a small community of people that started to try and make a statement about something. But very importantly as well was the statement to the politician, to the people living in, in the area, to the Mr. White Collar, the person wearing the white collar, the, the municipal worker, or the Miss Residents, the person living there. Don't shit in the water because we might want to drink it from it tomorrow. So it's a very simple concept of you know, respect that which we have rather than um, just using it for your own advantage which within the context of South Africa was a very, very important statement. But condition specifically and not only site specifically, I think it is a global concept that needs to be acknowledged. So here the, the, the act of responding to that theme becomes quite, quite interesting. A very personal reflection, pushing the ball up the hill, struggling like Sisyphus, or a collective statement um, in taking ownership of a space and actually trying to um, do something about something that you're not happy about. So uh, another topic that uh, I address quite a lot and I've done a lot of projects around is this topic of xenophobia and migration. In South Africa, given the fact that we are a melting pot of country, all other countries in one and many people come and commute and, and move across rivers or sleep in no man's land in order to get to the other side or smuggle themselves into, in, into the country, end up in, a, in, in Johannesburg as a big city and there's an incredible xenophobia there given... Um, like in many places, people believing that their jobs are being taken and things have, are going the wrong way, and how do we deal with that? And so, um, again, it's, I'm presenting site-specific projects. I'm going to present two or three that are based in South Africa and some based in Europe and just uh, compare them. But again, it's the question that we raised last time around the line on the map that creates a border, the conditions and the space that are created to separate people from each other. And uh, again, in Johannesburg, in South Africa, right next to Alexandra Township, which I've now introduced to you, the place where the water rises and the shacks get flooded away, which looks a little bit like this. When you Google search it, um, sits right next to Santon, which is a very, very wealthy place. It's one of the richest um, square kilometers in, in Africa with big sky rise buildings and lots of money. And the two live side by side from each other. The one services the other one. They literally share a line on the map as a border. And, um, you know, the community from, from the township moves into the, the city to help service the city. And then that night they move back again. A very strange economic and powerful relationship, which is not always to the benefit of the, those that are working. Quite the contrary. It's making the one place richer and the other place poorer. So we were provoked by a big hotel that was being built where from the swimming pool of one of the suites, when you're sitting in your hotel swimming pool, you look out and you see the shacks and the township on the other side. And this perverse relationship between wealth and poverty um, is something that we were curious about. And we realized in, in the research, again with the artists from Alexandra Township, that wealth is sometimes defined very differently. 
Um, in this case, wealth obviously is great if you've got a big house, but if you have goats, for example, you're wealthy too. And running around all over the township are, are goats. They are free to roam around. They, they run around and they're protected by some unspoken law. And so our decision was, how could we get the goats to roam not in the township, but in the city? And so as a provocation, as a gesture of crossing borders, we said, let us work with artists that are struggling with xenophobia within, this, within the township area, and let's work together with someone that owns some goats and herd them from the township into the city. And what happens when you suddenly take these free-roaming goats that, that are moving around through one neighborhood and you cross them over into this very opulent place where this is the, five star, the fountain outside the five-star hotel modeled on an Italian piazza, you know, in terms of the grandeur to show how important we are. And what would happen if we do that? What, 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 what does it mean to move a cultural symbol from one context, from a kind of cultural context to another very much European and Western notion of wealth and, and, and everything? And we thought the first thing was going to happen is we're going to get arrested. So the first thing we thought, how do we avoid the police arresting us? How do we avoid the private p police service which, which protects this area um, from, from arresting us? And exactly the opposite happened. The people that are working in those spaces, the police, the, the service industry, the portier from the five-star hotel standing right here, they are the ones that came and said, no, stop, you're doing it wrong. This is how you herd a goat. And they started to show us how to do it. That they recognized the value of what we were doing. Not in, because we were herding the goats incorrectly. Because I was going, sure, go, go, go. <laughs> you know, they say, no, no, you take it by the horn. And you, sh and you tap it on the back. And then that's how you, go you herd the, the, the lead goat. And suddenly by having people that live, and uh, sorry, that work in this environment, show us how to do it. Put a smile on everyone's face because we realized that it is ingrained in everyone's being that there's a common knowledge. The best part for me was I then stood back and I watched these goats running around the city part and I thought, okay, I'm not being arrested. It's going to be interesting leaving again with the goats because I wasn't sure what, how we were going to do that. And as I'm standing there, there's this man in his tie and he gets out of his Jaguar, out of his big fancy 4x4 Jaguar. He kind of gets out and he stands next to his big car. And, and, he, and he smiles, a big smile on his face. Um, so I said, do you like what's happening here? And he says, yes. So I said, do you live there? And I point at this building behind. He says, yes, I own one of the penthouses. So he's a very, very wealthy man. So I said, okay, and why do you like this? And he says, because in my hometown, I have a whole herd of goats. And you've now brought my hometown into the city. And there was this incredible moment where I realized that migration and the concept of migration and the xenophobia, it comes down to what gift you offer others. How do you welcome people into your home or into your space? So flying now to Europe and to Austria, with that same question in mind, we enter Linz. Linz, small uh, town in Austria. You might know it. It's the home of the Ars Electronica Center, the Media Art Hub. And um, uh, the, the, there's a major, this was a few years ago, uh, the Syrian war breaks out and there's a major influx of Syrian refugees that arrive in Linz at the main station. And everyone doesn't know what to do because now there's a trauma that's happening to the people living in Linz, obviously. You know, their world is being threatened by what's not theirs. And so there were a few provocations. I'm going to show you two. The one was, well, how do we ask people to rethink the city that they're entering? How can we reconceptualize the urban spaces that we're in? So again, site and condition specific. I am displaced from a place that's been destroyed. I am now living in a new place. How do I make sense of this relationship? So fortunately, there was a big map printed out in the, in the um, uh, Rathaus, which is the, the city hall on the floor. And um, there was a, a team of Syrian refugees, uh, two of, one of them was an artist and two others that, that he brought along that said they'd like to do something together to collaborate and think about something that could talk about place. And so while we were comparing our maps of where they were from, and this two of them were from Aleppo, to the map on the floor of Linz, and trying to find similarities, 
We also started to think about, well, what are the buildings that have been destroyed? What are the places that people consider symbols of their own city? And now they don't have that anymore. It just doesn't exist. It's not like you can go home to anything. That building that you know was there is no longer there. And now you're being displaced and you've been given an apartment to live in another place, but the place that you want to go to doesn't exist. How do we reconceptualize? How do we remap? How do we rethink our city? And so that's exactly what we did. Just with a piece of paper, like you've got in front of you, and a pen, we started to say, well, where are the things that are important to you? What is it that we want to map and redraw? And then other people joined us, and it became quite an interesting exercise of redrawing the city on this map. And then how do we compare different locations and different elements that we have, the luxury of Google, to play with? And then there are models, city models, a beautiful city model of Linth. And so we started to place objects of the city into the model. And we started to think about how can we change the city? Now, this is a really complex thing to think that this Christian little town is suddenly going to host a big mosque. You know, for most people living in Linz, that is a very complex thing to consider. But it needs to happen. Places need to change. And places that were maybe destroyed in one place can have traces in another place. They don't have to be site-specific. They can be based on the condition that we as human beings want to relate to a place. And maybe we need to make new memories. And in retrospect, one of the, arts, uh, one of the participants, not the arts, one of the other participants in this project um, wrote to me and said, every time I walk down this particular road in Linz, I smile because I remember that actually there's a similarity in the experience that I have. And the main reason for that is that we started to project into the streets the scenes and the images of a destroyed city into, into Linz. These are the little cutouts that we then used with torches, and we create little shadow games. And this particular one was what amused him so much. And he says every time he walks onto the Hauptplatz in Linz, he sees the mosque that will one day stand here. Not because it's a symbol of resistance or change or whatever, but just because that's what makes him feel at home. And so this little image for me became this really interesting symbol of a gesture towards someone that is, that is entering a, a, a space that is really in that in-between unknown territory of what is home, what is not home, where do I belong, and how do I get there? And so zooming out and thinking a bit bigger, we then said, great, well, maybe we should change the city completely. <laughs> we wanted to propose a renaming of the whole city, which never happened. Um, but we, we decided, look, in Johannesburg, all the st street names were being changed because we have a new government and we had apartheid as a history and things needed to change and heroes are no, no longer heroes, they are new heroes, so roads have to change. And so while this whole crisis was going on in Johannesburg, we're thinking, well, how can we take this workshop that we did further? And we realized that our street where we were working and living has been changed. So I said, well, why don't we change the street? Why don't we change a neighborhood name? Let's do something that can acknowledge that change is coming. And so while this was happening in the media, these all media images of what was happening in Linz and the resistance that people had with signs saying, we don't want foreigners here, and there were all kinds of complex things, um, and uh, certain parties being not listening to the provocations, uh, wanting to stop the, uh, the asylum chaos. We proposed to the Ars Electronica Festival for, this, for that particular year of the festival, let us do a social project to create a welcoming gesture. Again, an offering. An act in public space that isn't just one person pushing a ball, but is a community of people pushing a ball. And we proposed this particular park, which links the uh, main train station to the city center, called the Stadtpark, to get a street that runs down the middle of that park renamed. And so we, there was a flyer that went out, give this path a name. What is its name? And we did a four month campaign. Um, and in that four months, we collected names from all over the place. We did workshops, we did community engagement sessions. There was a little te television insert, etc. And we started to map all the names out. And then a jury was put together and a name was given to that road. But what was, what was interesting was not just the moment that the road was renamed and we rolled out the red carpet and the there was a new name for the road, but it was the process of getting there. And I'm not showing you many pictures of the process because it's not about you. It's not about your relationship to the process. It's the process that people went through that were in the workshops, going through the sessions, saying, you really want to give the thing my name? Or you really want me to come up with a name? 
And that question was an interesting one, not only to the immigrants, but there were some name proposals, for example, that said, we don't want them here road, or off road. <laughs> you know, literally very aggressive responses to say, um, you know, we want the road to be called stay out, you know, literally. And you know, we had to put them to the jury, and the jury decided what to do with them. And luckily, the jury decided on a very nice name, which the mayor opened, and it's Der Weg der Begegnung, so the path of encounters. And now it's officially called that. It's actually on maps, it's, it's the Weg der Begegnung, and the signs all around the place. And what's really nice about it is this path of encounters is not very overarchingly strong name. You know, it's a very gentle name, actually. But it is the gesture of four months of dialogue just about the naming of a street. I know we could have spent the four months talking about solving a food crisis for, for the asylum seekers or the housing crisis, but it was more important to actually know that something like changing the city name or the road name is as important in creating a place of home. And the fact that every time people walk down that street now that were part of this project, which were many hundreds of people that now live in Linz, they, had the, they have the chance to walk down a road that they be believe somehow belongs to them, even though they are in a foreign place. And I think those are these offerings that we make as artists, that it's not just about us pushing the ball by ourselves up a hill, but actually thinking about how we can provoke in public space. And so that provocation I want to take one step further. This is a real hardcore provocation, and we'll hopefully get some aggressive responses afterwards. Um, it's called Blackout. So Stephen and, I, Stephen and I get invited to the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands sit off the coast of Africa, and it's one of the hotspots for a lot of migrants trying to get to Europe. So they hop on boats from anywhere here in West Africa to get to Europe. And the Canary Islands is very often where the boats either sink close by or people get stranded on the beaches. And so these kind of images that you see in the media are quite common. And so there's this massive movement of people around. So Stephen and I had been to Mali and done a project in Mali, so in West Africa here around it. We've done a project in Senegal around it, and we've been thinking, okay, well, how does this work? And the museum in um, the Grand Canary, uh, in the island Grand Canaria, which is in the Canary Islands, invited us to be on the show called Travesia. And in the museum, there were all these artists from the African continent dealing with this migration issue. So now we're sitting there going, great, we as African artists, as a whole continent, are going to make a statement about trying to get to Europe, when all we're doing as artists is trying to get to Europe. We want to have the next show at the big new museum in Europe because that's where the money is. <laughs> and so we were starting to say, well, actually, what happens when you start asking the Europeans if they want us there? What happens if you start going to the people that are sitting on the beaches and say, can I talk to you about the West Africans that are going to land on your beach? Can we sit down and talk? And they're busy sun tanning. They're lying there waiting for the sun to make them browner than they are. Strange, perverse world. And so... We start asking a few critical questions on our research trip, and basically we get shut down. No, we don't want to talk to you. We'd be, be too busy suntanning. Or, this is, not, this is not up to me, this is not my topic, this is not my problem. And so we thought, okay, if this island is dark at night, then the migrants that are coming with their boats won't see the island, and the boat will miss the island, and the migrants will drown somewhere else, and they're not our problem. So let's ask the whole island to turn off the lights at night to create a complete blackout so that the island is dark and the migrants miss the island because that's basically what Europe is doing, kind of ignoring the problem, or at the time, I have to, things have changed since, but at the time, ignoring the problem and saying it's not there. And so we created this campaign called Blackout and Blackout basically was a poster, billboard and television campaign that said, turn off your lights at night between these dates in order to avoid the West Africans landing on your beaches. So make the island dark, let them drown somewhere else. Quite a problematic campaign coming from a white South African. Another story. So we decided, let's try. Let's try this. Let's speak to the curator. Let's see how aggressive we can be. And they welcomed the idea. And so late at night, we went poster campaigning, blackout. On the TV, we were able to buy some S time and we had these adverts coming up say, turn off your lights at night, we want to avoid the West Africans, blackout. You're a very aggressive kind of anti-immigrant um, uh, campaign. Um, on, the, on the facade of the museum, the whole museum, we blacked out the windows so that no light could come from the museum. So that 
the museum would stay dark at night. We wrote a letter to the mayor to say, dear mayor of Gran Canaria, please can you turn off all the lights on the island on these dates so that the West Africans don't come to your beaches and you don't have that problem. Obviously, we didn't get a response, but not getting a response is just as important as an acknowledgement. And so this provocation, I'm showing you this extreme other side to the very gentle idea of community workshopping, because I think it's, again, part of pushing the ball up the hill, part of that struggle. I had such a problem personally doing this project. It was against every fiber of my body to do something like this. As I said before, white South African living in South Africa, experiencing apartheid, making sense of my own identity in that place, constantly asking the question of my white privilege, and then doing a blackout project was a kind of a real challenge to myself. It was like even more so than pushing the ball up the hill. The response was incredible. Not only did people pull the posters down, which is what we wanted, very aggressively, every morning we found the posters down, but the artists that were on the show in the museum, mainly black African artists from the continent, came out in groups and started to put the posters up in broad daylight because they, as artists, weren't being heard in the works that they were making. And so for me, that was such an interesting thing. We make art in a museum to try and change something that happens outside the museum. And so the site specificity of working in Gran Canaria was confined to the box of the museum. The works were beautiful in the museum, excellent works, but they were safe because of the borders of the museum. They were understandable because they were art. But the moment the artists saw these posters, they said, we like this because it takes our anxiety of being black artists in Gran Canaria very personally, and we're going to do this. And so suddenly we had a whole team of artists going and posting and pasting some of these posters up. And that changed the dynamic then of the show. And in, in the symposium afterwards, the project was obviously a provocation. And it created the most incredible debate where people literally stood up in the audience and shouted at us. And it was good because that's sometimes what we need. We need to be in the firing line of that which we don't believe in, in order to evoke something that hopefully affects change. Now, I can't say that the project changed anything other than the opinion of a few, few people about me, but it was very important for us as a community of artists to go through and for me personally to go through to understand what does it mean to provoke on a completely other level where it goes against the very belief that you have and yet achieves the same goal as some other ones. Like, for example, Ataya. Ataya is the opposite. Ataya links uh, South Africa, France, and Senegal. So the water time, not wasting it. The, um, the French are very present on the African continent, co the colonial power of France, and have a lot of seasons where they invite different countries to collaborate with them. And so they said to us, can we do a collaboration in South Africa about French coming to South Africa and vice versa, exchange between the two places. And Stephen and I, I presented this project in a previous uh, lecture, did a project in Senegal, which was all about getting to know community in, in Johannesburg. And so we said, well, actually, we're not interested in French cheese and wine. We're not interested in French music. We're interested in the Francophone Africans on the continent because they are a result of your French colonial history. So can we not do our project about them? And so one of the things that we noticed when we went to Senegal, which is one of the French colonies, and most of the um, area have this tradition, is a tradition of tea drinking. So drinking tea is extremely important as a cultural identity of bringing people together. There's a saying in Senegal that when you're lost, make tea, and you'll get people to show you the way, because you know, immediately you create a community. And it's a beautiful ritual. You get three different types of tea. You brew it like this. Um, and you, you, you brew it and brew it. And the first one is called death because it's very bitter. You drink and it's like, you know. the next one is a bit sweeter and smoother. So it's called uh, a friendship. And the third one is super sweet. By that point, it's love. And the whole idea is that by the time you get to the final brewed uh, tea, you're just in a community and, and everything is good. And so we loved that idea. And so what we did is we went into one of the most dangerous parts of Johannesburg, which is overrun with gangsters and gangs and and, uh, and drug dealing, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, it's where the Senegalese and many other West Africans hide away from the police because either they are there illegally or because they're being um, abused by the police, which is unfortunately in the corrupt system always there. And they get misunderstood 
by, this, by people that think they're bad because they're foreign. And what we did, we created a big tea ceremony where we had all these tea stations and people were making tea for their neighbors, for people that were scared of them, for people that had run away from the city. Then we invited them back to the city, so let's have tea together and let's create this community moment. And what was amazing, I was sitting between someone in the one uh, session who, who was living two doors away from another person. The one was South African, the one is Senegalese, and they'd never spoken to each other because they were afraid of each other. The one was afraid of being treated badly by the local, and the local was afraid of the foreigner. And so they had tea together. And that exchange, very minimal, very beautiful, no aggressive posters, just having tea created a very different dynamic in the space. And for me, it was a very important moment because when I go into these dangerous neighborhoods, because I work in that space a lot, because as an artist, I find it exciting to actually understand these complexities of social space, I get known as the tea guy now. <laughs> you know? And there's something quite valuable about that idea of having a community of people that you can drink tea with. So as an artist, it was a personal challenge for how do I entrench myself in a place and make sense of it. So with the success of that project, the next year we were supposed to show South African culture in France. So we said we don't want to show South African culture in France. We don't want to just bring export some musicians or some visual artists to show, have a show in France. We suggest we do the same thing. We have an African tea ceremony in Paris, in the most complex neighborhoods. And this was at a terrible time in Paris where um, there were all kinds of riots on the streets, etc. And this is still in Hilbra. Sorry, this is still in Johannesburg. Um, and, then, and then we ended up in Paris and in Saint-Ouen, Saint-Denis, and in the 19th, uh, 18th district, um, outside the Luxor Cinema, for example, or um, in the markets, we ended up having these tea ceremonies. But the interesting thing was it wasn't just Senegalese tea. It was the Mauritanian arguing with the Senegalese which tea is better. It was the Malian saying to the Algerian, wait a minute, this is, this is interesting, you know. You drink more coffee, I drink more tea, and blah, 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 you know, these debates. And suddenly it was this community of exchange between people about what they drink and who invented tea in the first place. And this incredible connection between foreigners amongst themselves. While the Parisians were all sitting there thinking it was very charming to have tea with the foreigners. You know, very pleased with themselves. But it was exactly that break that was so interesting for us. The best part is the police were standing all around watching us because there was no public gathering permitted at the time in Paris. But we weren't gathering, we were just having tea. We weren't doing any political protests, we were just having tea. We weren't making art in public space, we were just having tea. And so there, there was a very strange um, uh, a kind of confrontation between those people, the people that organized this with us and hosted us in Paris and the police not knowing, like, what are we really doing? Is this an artistic project? Is this a community project? Oh, but we're just having tea. And this exchange and communication became even more exciting when um, this, uh, this housing complex, which hosts a lot of foreign Africans that, that end up in Paris as a temporary housing, started to bring out their chairs and tables and, and their umbrellas and suddenly invited us to come make tea with them. And it was the most beautiful thing. It became this culture of occupying public space and actually saying the crisis that we're in, we can taste in the flavor of the tea that we make and the exchange of dialogue that we have. So embodying it is sometimes really about literally giving someone a taste of what the crisis could be. And so this, again, looking at the conditions of Vienna versus South Africa versus Paris versus Senegal, etc., it's not about the site, it's about the acknowledgement of the artist's role in giving a moment of vision into a solution for the crisis or provoking the crisis by being quite aggressive or searching for something which they know they can't find, something that is very personal, something that is like pushing the ball up the hill, being Sisyphus, they can't find the answer. And I invited someone into my studio who I um, have a very strange relationship with. He's from Zimbabwe and he works in, in Johannesburg. And I said to him, I want to think about the crisis that you're in. I want to think about and process what, what you're about. But I'm going to stand here and think about it. And I'm going to give you something, and you do whatever you want with this. And this is what he did to me.
So Wiseman took advantage of the fact that I said I wouldn't do anything. I would just let him do whatever he wants to me. And it was that moment of me acknowledging that in the process of trying to make sense of my own role as an artist in the studio and having an opinion and a perspective that I'd be interested to know what his perspective is in the act rather than in the speech. And the journey that you saw now is a very short moment of a very long uh, process. But I think symbolizes for me very much what we as artists go through very often and being very introspective about that which we think we know about. When actually, as I said right in the beginning, it's not knowing how to define that which is not definable because of common language. We have to find a gesture towards trying to define it and trying to make sense of it. Because while the crisis exists, the good and the bad together needs, it, it needs a voice and we are the ones to give it. So I'm hoping, I'm going to stop there now given time, I'm hoping that these examples that I showed you start to fuse some actions, some activities, some gestures and some offerings that talk about site and condition specific responses and that are some are provocations to you as well as artists to think about, well, how do, do I apply myself? Am I not in the studio making marks like we spoke about last week, drawing a line to do something? What happens if I start thinking about my relationship as an artist to a crisis moment and how can I embody that? And how can I create a gesture towards the person next to me to find a language and response? And that's very much about what we spoke about. How do you actually access a community through giving in order to get back so that you can do your research as an artist, so you can make your art? And I hope that I instilled that in today's session. Um, we've got, I don't know, it's half past five. The next lecture is going to start shortly. But I do want to ask if that's okay while we're switching over the lectures. If there are questions, we can ask one-on-one -on -one afterwards. I'm here. Um, but that we all bring our little mini worlds that we made. For those of you that came late, you don't know what this is about. It doesn't matter. Those that made your little mini worlds, I'd love it if we can just set them up on the table here and then I'll photograph them later. Um, so come forward and place your little worlds that you've made during the session if you feel comfortable to do that. And if you want to share it with me later after the, after the next lecture, uh, by all means. Otherwise, I'm going to photograph each one and insert it into the video that I made from the last lecture so that there's an ongoing conversation that happens between you and me, because right now I'm just the one talking. So thank you for your attention. I hope that all made sense and I wasn't too fast. So can I hand over or what's the next step? Um, I'm looking at you. Yes. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so if you want, uh, some, um, Do we have a few minutes for questions? Minutes okay. So five minutes for questions. I mean, doesn't have to be. Uh, last time there was all the questions came later. So, um. yes, of course. Yes. Of course, yes. I mean, I think that's a natural. It's a natural conclusion of that which gets judged first, and that is the way we look. So. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's only because of um, being white, being male. It's because I've shaved my head. It's because I'm a certain size. It's because I have a little girl working, walking next to me through the inner city of Johannesburg, which is a kind of complex space to be in. You say, how can you take a child there? It's because I put myself into places where I want the question to be asked. And I think that's the important part as an artist. I, I want people to stop me and say, who are you? Why are you? because it makes my work more interesting as an artist in self-reflecting on my own role and responsibility. And my problem in Vienna now is, and this is an interesting conundrum, is so I, I relocate for the sake of my daughter and other reasons to Vienna for, for a while, and suddenly I'm anonymous. Suddenly this face is like every other face. There's another bald guy right here. He's also white. He looks like me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and suddenly I can disappear. And suddenly my agency as an artist has completely changed. So now I really have to like stand up and do that for someone to notice me. Before I could just walk into a room and everyone else was different to me because everyone was black and I was white and I was being treated differently. Now I have to stand up and scream in order to be recognized and it doesn't work because then I'm just the white angry male artist. And so it's a really complex place to be. It's, I'm, I'm sharing something very personal with you because it's that point at which I constantly have to reassess who am I as an artist, why am I doing things, and then why are people treating me the way they are? 
am I getting more opportunities? Am I getting less opportunities? And it's not always about measuring opportunities. I'm saying opportunities for conversation, not money opportunities or something like that. Am I, am I welcomed in a community or am I rejected? Do I stand for the evil in some places? Do I stand for the friend in others? You know, these are all things we have to, we do that every day in our lives. But it becomes very evident when you relocate from one place to another one and you go, oh my word, this is so different to what I expected. And by your nodding, I'm sure you understand what I mean. How does one deal with it? Make art about it. Don't just take a picture of your face and say, this is who I am, because we can see that face already. That's my problem with a lot of the, and no disrespect to artists that are doing that, it's good to do that too, but you know, very often just talking about one's identity is one thing. But actually doing something that engages other people's common identity and their own condition, because we connect it in ways that we don't even know yet. You and I, completely different contexts, different worlds. But we can find a strand, and that's by sharing a studio, because we're both creative, some are, in one form or another, and so we can find that. And I think that is a kind of a powerful language that, uh, that I've been able to use to navigate um, how people see me, because you see me differently once I'm jumping around in the studio with you versus when I'm in a lecture versus when I'm in the shops and trying to get in front of you in the queue because I'm in a rush. <laughs> you know, so these are different moments and uh, yeah. So make art about those moments is my response. Okay, so if there are no other questions, can we take the last two minutes of the five minutes and come and put your little worlds here and that means you also get to move because it's important to move between lectures. And I hand over my space to you. 